I'm going to tell you about our experience in taking care of these babies about neonatal abstinence syndrome. And it's not entirely agreed upon. First of all, it's a, it's a strange term. Uh, and what's been used more frequently is neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, which is really what, more of what we're talking about. So that the babies aren't abstaining, and the, the terminology is, is kind of old and a little bit clunky. And then who gets, who gets diagnosed with that? We say, like, well, these people are more likely to have it. Um, if you think about the opioid withdrawal syndrome and the description of it is it's this constellations of signs and symptoms of withdrawal. And so that's, that's to me what the diagnosis is, but that is not what you often see in the literature. Often in the literature, it's those who receive medication, uh, which is n does nowhere in the definition. So whenever you see studies about the rates of who gets it and who doesn't, you have to take it with a grain of salt because the definitions are very different. And I think if the kid's having withdrawal, that's opioid withdrawal syndrome or NAS, and so the numbers you're reading are probably uh, un not, not useful. So these kids are mostly managed in neonatal intensive care units. Uh, in 2012, a study showed somewhere between 4 and 5 percent of uh, NICU beds were filled with uh, babies with NAS. I'm going to use NAS just because I'm used to saying that, but I really mean now is this probably a better way to say it. I'll try to remember to start saying that more. Um, so. Uh, and then in some community hospitals, that, that number would be as high as 50%, particularly in our state, a lot of the community hospitals, that is what their neonatal intensive care units are taking care of, and it's almost exclusively that. So uh, it's a big problem. The average length of stay for these kids around the country is somewhere around three weeks, which um, outside of prematurity is the longest length of stay in anything in pediatrics, and it's not close. So kids with complicated pneumonias with chest tubes, they don't have lengths of stay this long. This is far and away the longest length of stay in any pediatrics. By the way, I'm, I'm actually not a neonatologist. I'm a pediatric hospitalist, so how I got involved with this I'll get to, but it's usually neonatologists who are talking about this, but I'm not one of them. Uh, I did my residency there and then I got out. I'm also not an expert in addiction medicine. All I know about addiction was the stuff we learned this morning, plus I watched The Wire <laughs> and the movie Train Spotting, and so those are, that's about it. And so, but a lot of the processes, and, like the, the, the action of the locus ceruleus is very much happening in the baby. So the baby is exposed to these opioids if they're in a maintenance program, the mom's in a maintenance program throughout the pregnancy, and their brain is adjusting to that. And so they're upregulating certain receptors, and then they're born, and they're not getting the opioid anymore. That's when they're supposedly abstaining at that point. Um, and then you get this surge of things like norepinephrine, and that seems to coincide with the withdrawal signs. And again, the locus ceruleus has been found to be the, the area there as well. So who's taken care of, and I know we're, we're in a, vir virtually you can raise your hand too at the other side, but so who's taking, actually taking care of these kids? Has anyone met any of these babies? There, yeah, so, okay. And so does anyone recognize that, that Finnegan tool? That seems familiar, okay. Uh, and these are, for those of you who haven't met them, these aren't the, like, the most cheerful babies you've ever met. Um, they're not the most fun to have around. Um, and figuring out how to manage them, it was, a, it, we've been seeing these kids since the 1800s and the, the mortality rate uh, in the first reports was, the first report had 12 of these kids and nine of them died. And, there's, and through, the, through into the 1950s, there was a really high mortality rate for this. And in the 1970s, in, uh, in the, then when methadone therapy came in in the 60s, it started to get a little bit better. And then in the 70s, there was a heroin epidemic in Philadelphia, and they were seeing lots of these babies. And so they started to look at, all right, what are the signs and symptoms we're seeing? Let's get them into a tool. And that is where the Finnegan tool came from. And so, and that's probably, you're all familiar with this. The general concept, if you're not, is, they again, basically looked at all the signs and symptoms of withdrawal. They categorize them into diff different areas, like uh, nervous system, where you have things like high-pitched cry. Uh, this hyperactive moral reflex. Anyone, has there, em, anyone done a moral reflex on a kid and you're trying to teach it to somebody? Do it on one of these kids because it's like the most <laughs> dramatic thing you've seen. So they'll have tremors, they'll have increased muscle tone, uh, they'll have this myoclonic jerks, their seizures are listed on this. And then there's ones in the metabolic ones which you'll have sweating, fever, everything kind of just going faster basically. Nasal stuffiness, sneezing. And then gastrointestinal things, you'll have uh, poor feeding, loose stools, and then my favorite is excessive sucking. So just like whatever your threshold for the top of <laughs> sucking is, it's a little bit more than that. That would be excessive, I think. Um, and so they've all been given a point total, and, and the things that seem worse are given three points, and the things that don't seem as bad are one. So if you have seizures, you get three points, and if you uh, sneeze too many times, that's one point. So, and you add them up, and for those of you who've done it, what's the magic number? 
eight, right? So eight, so if you get a score above eight is where you start medication. Again, that sort of got morphed into the diagnosis, which is not what it is. So it's when you get a score of eight, that's when you start medication. <laughs> So the, the general approach to treating these kids has been, you're supposed to do sort of non-pharmacologic care first, and then when you get your, and you do the Finnegan score, and again, almost at about nine, the last survey was 98% of places are using Finnegan scores. That's in the country, and it looks like also basically worldwide. And then most of the research has been trying to figure out what the right medication is to treat these kids with, or combination of medications. And so that has been, that is still an open question. And fortunately, at Yale, we managed to go through almost all of these. So the first one uh, that we used was this one, paragoric, which looks like something you shouldn't give to anybody. <laughs> and that's right. So that is, uh, has tincture of opium. And tincture of opium means it's 30% alcohol, also not great to start with. But they also add some things like camphor and other things that cause cancer in it. So I'm not sure why that was the choice. But we moved uh, to tincture of opium uh, after that, which was just the alcohol, which I guess was okay. Um, and so one of the things you'll see is a comparison of tincture of opium with morphine. And the outcomes that we're looking at mostly with this is length of stay in the hospital or length of treatment with your opioid. So, uh, so they found those were about even. Next. And then we, uh, we went to, uh, to morphine. Uh, and we did that because in the 90s, our pharmacy told us that we were moving to morphine. So we did. Um, it was not a, not a real decision. Um, I was still in college, so it wasn't, I didn't have anything to do with it. Um, and then, uh, and so the comparison, what you'll see from the, the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines is said if you're withdrawing from something, you should give a like medication. So if you're withdrawing from an opioid, you should give an opioid. And so, uh, because some places will use phenobarbital as a first-line agent. Anyone have any experience with that? Yeah. So, okay. So that's that. Phenobarbital is not a like agent. It's a it's a more of a sedative. And so this was a study from um, Scotland, which compared morphine versus phenobarbital and found a lower length of stay for the morphine group. Phenobarbital is often used. There's a few places, as you said, we'll use it as first-line agent, but lots of places will use it as a second or sort of third, or like when you, you kind of max out on your opioid, then you add phenobarbital at the end. And so, uh, and this study is actually from, from Brown, and this is in, in, the, in 2002, and what they did is they gave half the kids tincture of opium and half the, half the kids tincture of opium plus phenobarbital right from the start. What they found is the length of stay for the group that got the phenobarbital was half that of the other group, so a really dramatic finding. In fact, so has anyone ever looked at like Cochrane Review articles, which are like a meta-analysis? And so they, the, what, the one feature that I found in every one of them I've read is when you get to the conclusion, it always says, you need more studies. <laughs> the only one that I read that didn't do this was this one that said, this is what you should be doing. This, these results were so powerful that this is what everyone should be doing. We didn't do that, but anyway, next. So uh, methadone has also been used as uh, a first-line agent a lot more recently. Uh, Morphine is the most commonly used. 60 or 70 percent of places will use morphine as first line, and now somewhere around 30 will use methadone. Does anyone use methadone here as first line here? So it's getting more popular on the East Coast. This was a study from Maine, which uh, I just take a moment because no one will ever say that to you again because there's no people in Maine. But <laughs> so those who do, we they do like their opioids there. Um, and we again on the East Coast, we are way ahead of you guys in this. We know we can get into any of the other drugs. We were always been really really pro uh, opioids. So, uh, so they found the group that got methadone had a lower length of stay than the group that got morphine. And there's been a few other studies more recently which have shown some of the same thing, but others have shown otherwise with that. And then there's a study from Johns Hopkins uh, that, and this, was, this, was a, this came out just before I started as a hospitalist. So actually, this, they didn't publish this until 2009, but they, were, they presented the, uh, the abstract in 2006. And they gave some of the, these kids um, Tincture of opium, they gave half of them tincture of opium, half of them tincture of opium plus clonidine right from the beginning. The kids who got clonidine did a little bit better at a lower length of stay. And that's, that clonidine is supposed to kind of blunt that norepinephrine response. It's used in adults, they'll use the, a clonidine patch sometimes. The general standard approach is, um, next, is medications are the key to treatment. They're mostly, there is some, uh, quite a, actually quite a bit of variation of where these kids are managed, but they're mostly managed in NICUs. You will find some in general nurseries, some on general pediatric floors, some will be done outpatient, most in the NICU, and lots of combinations of those things. But NICUs are kind of the mainstay. Uh, Finnegan scores drive the treatment. So you, you're born, you, everyone knows how to do that. You score them, 
you get your, your three scores of eight, which is what most places will do, and then you start your medication. And once you start your medication, you uh, will, will wean very slowly. Usually ev every day or every other day, you'll go down by something like 10% of the original dose. Does that sound familiar to people who have treated these kids? So that's a general idea. And then just like the, the NICU, uh, one of our previous speakers mentioned his experience in the NICU. I had a very similar one. I once, I once examined a baby without asking anybody. And I just did that that one time because I would never do that again. Um, so the, one of the advantages of a NICU is the nursing staff who owns the babies and takes, like, takes them as their own. And so, and you care for these babies and get them healthy and then give, get, them, get them back to their family. So what we were, did at Yale when I started as a hospital in 2006, and I had been a resident there before, but what we would do is the baby would be born, and they would go from the delivery room right to the NICU, be monitored using the Finnegan scores, once they got three scores of eight, they would be started on morphine, and then we started to use clonidine just before I started. And they would, and they would we, we had a, a bit of a smaller NICU then, uh, and, and so after about seven or 10 days, once they felt like they had stabilized the morphine dose, they would transfer them up to the general inpatient unit where we would finish this wean. And we were doing our weans every other day. So you had to have two days of scores less than eight, and then you go down by 10% by of the original dose. So if you do the math on that, yeah, you're going to have a pretty long length of stay. So it's hard to stay much, much shorter than four weeks in that situation. We started almost every one of our methadone-exposed kids. And with all the, you know, the, the, again, the, the data on which is better and which is worse, as I'll explain later, you, you do have to take some of it with a grain of salt. But, but certainly my experience with kids with methadone is I'm yet to see one that hasn't had withdrawal. Um, and I have seen a few kids who have been exposed to buprenorphine uh, who haven't, and, so, and some who have come in on heroin where the withdrawal is actually less severe. Um, so methanol was the most consistent and, and usually uh, the, the most severe. And so those kids would be managed on the floor, and we would go through the wean, and at the end of it, we would send them home. And the, our average length of stay was 28 days. So now, as a hospitalist, I don't like having people in the hospital because that's like more work for me. So, uh, so and we would just sit there and, and usually we're good at like moving kids along and you come in and they have asthma and we send them home the next day. And these kids were just here forever. And we'd be watching them and they seemed like they were fine. We had gone down by this much on their morphine yesterday and now they seem fine the next day and I can't go down by this much again. So we just sort of fudged that part of our protocol. So we didn't tell anybody. Because this was, our protocol came from the, the NICU, the guys who had been there forever in the NICU, um, and they weren't really checking on us. We just sort of fudged that part, and we would just, if they seemed fine, we would just go down a little bit every day, which is what most places were doing anyway. So it didn't seem like that big a deal. Uh, and so, next slide. And so, um, so we, we found, we got some, we, we weren't, this was not a population I was interested in. In fact, there were two hospitals when we started, and we had an infant toddler floor and a school age floor. And the other guy was there the year before I was, and he got to choose which unit he got to work on. And he gave two reasons for why he wanted to work on the school age floor. One was he didn't want to take care of these kids, and the other one is he said he liked teenagers, which nobody believed. So he pretty much just said, <laughs> give me a break. <laughs> so, so I just kind of got stuck with these kids. This wasn't an interest, and this was not a population that I paid much attention to. I was learning how to do the job. We had a nice protocol. We just followed them um, when we would when we would sit on rounds, um, we would, this, we, used, we family center around now, but we used to sit around a table and talk about the patients, and the residents would just present the Finnegan scores, and then we would say go up or down on the medication. Like it was a pretty easy population to take care of. Most of the families weren't really around very much. It was, you know, they're here forever, but there wasn't much to do. My predecessor used to take the Finnegan scores at the end of the week and play the lottery for the resident team just to try to keep it interesting. They never won, but it kind of got people a little more involved. Okay, we've got these dots here. What I want you to do is mentally, I want you to connect all of these dots with four lines without taking your finger or pencil off the paper, all right? So I'll give you 30 seconds. If you know how to do it, then just sit back and look like you know what you're doing and just feel smug. And if you don't, just try to see if you can get, get it to work. I'll give you 30 seconds and go. Four lines. Four lines, don't take your finger off the paper. Connect all the dots. Okay, so, so this is an easy, it's, a, it's easy to solve. It's not that hard. And so, but in order, in order to do this, you have to 
think outside the box, which is where, this is where that statement comes from, if you didn't know. So the one take home think and have, that's where think outside the box comes from, is from this game. So, but next slide. So actually, here's the thing about that. We think like, oh, you know, you have this box, and you have to think outside it. If you look here, there is no box. That's actually what gets lost in this. There is no box. It's nine dots. There's no box. If there's a box in there, you made it yourself. Because that is not a box, right? That is nine dots. No one ever said the word box. There isn't a box there. It's nine dots. They happen to be lined up, but it is not a box. So keep that in mind as we go along. So when we look at our, our length of stay, we, I don't know how, frankly, we got this data because I certainly didn't look at it. I wasn't paying any attention to these kids. This was not my favorite population to deal with. The families were difficult. The nursing staff and the families did not get along well. Um, there were stories that, that one of my, uh, our nurse managers said that, you know, we were, we were very focused on the experience of the parent and, you know, we would make their, the beds up for them, the cots so they could sleep, and they would say, often with these families, they wouldn't, they wouldn't make the bed. They were trying to get them to not stay. It was always easier if they didn't stay because then we could just do what we were doing. We didn't have to deal with the family. So, but we, by doing this, uh, do, by doing this thing where we just fudged that, that going down on the medication uh, from every other day to every day, our length of stay went from 28 days to 22 and a half days, which was exactly basically the national average at the time. I don't know who found this data, but somebody did, and one of our residents had been moonlighting at Middlesex Hospital, which is 45 minutes up the road. And they are a community hospital, and they had a lot of these babies, and their average length of stay was six weeks. And they wanted to know what amazing things we were doing to get our length of stay so low, and they asked if I would come give them a talk on it. And so I said, okay, because we're supposed to say okay when people ask us to do those things. Um, but I only had like 90 seconds of material. I had our protocol, and then I had the thing about the lottery, and I had to somehow stretch that into an hour. So, uh, so that wasn't great um, for me. But I, so the main other thing I had to do was like read all those articles I listed before, which I hadn't read before because we had a protocol, and I just followed it. DTO is diluted tincture of opium. So the one study from Johns Hopkins, diluted tincture of opium versus tincture of opium plus clonidine, it was a median length of stay of 17 days versus 12 days. Then it was morphine versus phenobarbital. That's uh, the one from Scotland, uh, eight days uh, length of stay versus 12 days. Morphine versus tincture of opium, this was actually from Germany, it was 30 days versus 27 days. Tincture, this is the one from Brown that the, that the Cochrane Review likes so much. Tincture of opium plus phenobarbital is 79 days versus 38 days. And then the next one, methadone versus morphine, 17 days versus 24 days. We're still doing these studies. There was one in the New England Journal of Medicine last year where they compared giving the babies morphine versus buprenorphine. And the length of stay for the morphine kids was 33 days and for the buprenorphine kids was 21 days. New England Journal of Medicine. And what's nice about these babies is there's no past medical history. They were just born. And the reason that we're diagnosing what they are is they've kind of had the same exposures. So these are pretty much the same kids using the same protocols, yet the length of stay for kids getting tincture of opium ranged between 17 days and 79 days. And next. And then morphine, 8 days to 30 days, although if we include the New England Journal study, it's actually 33 days. And so uh, what other disease process do you see that kind of spread in length of stay? Don't think too hard. There's, no, there's nothing remotely like this. This is crazy. This makes no sense. And so what's the reason for it? Well, we thought about that, and what we determined was that we didn't know. So, um, <laughs> but that it was really weird. And what we did say is like, well, maybe it's not the medication. Since they're saying all these things, and the, they're using the same medications and the same protocols, and there's these wildly different lengths of stay, it seems logical that it might not be the medication. What we did is start to look at this, and you can see the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines. Uh, they list the first line treatment as non pharmacologic care, and they spend 62 words on it. And then they spend uh, 1,652 words on the, uh, on the medication stuff. So, so if you look at the protocols that, that I'm sure everybody's had, and, and is any, is it, there, there, I have never seen a protocol that doesn't say non pharmacologic care is the first line treatment. Um, and so, but when you go back and look at those studies, some of them mention that, some of them don't, certainly none of them control for that. Now, think about that again for, as a first-line treatment, that first of all, you don't, your diagnosis only comes when you start the second-line treatment, and we don't even consider it a treatment. So, so for the, so imagine, it look, imagine you wanted to study swaddling. You wanted to study the effect on swaddling, and you just said, yeah, I don't know, we gave some of the kids morphine. I, I don't know which ones or for how long, but we just gave it if we needed it. 
Uh, and, but, but we were looking at swaddling, and then uh, people would make fun of you. But that's pretty much what was happening. Non-pharmacologic care is just sort of, it's a throwaway. It doesn't sound like a real treatment. So if you're a neonatologist, and you have these kids on ECMO, and you have these impossibly tiny sort of baby things that you're making survive, and doing these incredible life-saving things, the idea of going like this, being a real treatment, doesn't sound very doctory or certainly intensivisty, which may not be a word, but that's okay. So, so that so it, does, it just doesn't seem like a real treatment. We give it lip service. We say yes, we'll do those things. Those are a good idea, but the real treatment is the medication. And so, this is where we started the least innovative project that I could ever think of. We just started to just paid attention to the guidelines. We just followed them. <laughs> so when we looked at where when we started from 2003 to 2010, our um, our average, uh, the, the percentage of kids who were treated with morphine, we had 150 kids during this time, and our, our numbers have gone way up. 98% um, of them were started on morphine, which is much higher than what you'll see in most of the literature, but I think we have an explanation for that. Go to the next slide. So, so this is, I'm going to show the data over time. This is, a, this is a, a control chart. So if you look at this, just to orient you from, I don't know if it's in color on the page, but the, the yellow dots are just each individual patient. And the black line is the average. And for us, the starting from 2008 to 2010 was 22 and a half days. The green line is the lowest length of stay that I could find for any big project recently. That was the Vermont Oxford Network. They did an improvement project on this. And they decreased their length of stay from 21 days to 19 days in the NICU, uh, which got published in pediatrics. Um, and then there, the red line at the top, and there's one on the bottom, is, are called the control limits. So that's three standard deviations from the mean on either side. And what that basically means is that you would expect uh, the next value to fall between those red lines, which isn't that helpful when it's between 50 and 0. And so one of the things when you're trying to improve things is you want to make those lines come closer together, and so you have a little more predictability in your, in your process. And so you really want... You want that black line to come down. In this case, we want a shorter length of stay if possible. And then we want there to be a little more predictability and so to have the red lines come close together. Now, <laughs> I say that our goal wasn't really to reduce length of stay. Uh, that's sort of how we've presented it. But we really wanted this just to go better for the babies and the moms. So we'll come back to that as well. OK, so that's where we were when we started. Now, what we started to do was to think about, just ask a very simple question, why we were doing the things we were doing. So I listed those five major tenets of how we cared for these kids. And so we were asking, why, so why were we doing it that way? And what we found was really interesting. We found that the answer for all those things was the same. The reason we were doing what we were doing today was because that's what we were doing yesterday. And that was it. And there was no basis for any of this stuff, really. And you can think about, as we go through this, if you were in the room when you decided to do this. OK, so medications are the first line treatment. That's who we consider treating kids. When we're talking about it, we're talking about medications. So why is that? It's not listed as a first line treatment. Fixed. So uh, it turns out, and this is going to blow your mind, uh, this is a study from Vancouver. It turned out what they did is instead of taking the baby and the mom and putting them apart, they put them together as if they were like a baby and a mom. And <laughs> it actually went OK. It actually went better. Seemed to be a better experience for both of them. And so we thought, huh, that seems just crazy enough that it might work. <laughs> and so, so we tried to do that a little bit. So we really started to focus on this non-pharmacologic care. We said, well, we can do this. We can try to put the, we have these kids for most of their hospitalization. We can put the baby and mom together. Um, and we can really focus on these non-pharmacologic things, which you know, I think we maybe said we were doing but weren't doing as well. So we, could con we wanted to create a low stimulation environment. We wanted to make sure we could hold the kids. We could feed them on demand, which we had always done feed on demand in our NICU as long as the demand was every three hours. Yeah. If it was anything other than that, it didn't really work. So we said it, but it, it, has anyone ever heard, heard uh, that a baby is not due to eat yet? I don't know what that means. So I don't know. Has anyone had a baby before? Yeah. And do, do you remember when they were due to eat? It was when they were ready to eat. But not in the NICU. It's every three hours. And if they, demand, if they manage to land on that, then great. But um, so you had some hungry babies. So, so we, fed, try, we could feed them on demand. We wanted to hold them, be able to, to jump on. There was actually two things that we found that we really couldn't do as a staff that these kids needed. One was feed on demand. There's a reason that they are fed on demand every three hours, because if you're taking care of a bunch of other kids, you need a schedule. So we joke about it, but I don't know how else to do it if you're supposed to be doing other things. And so if your only job is to take care of that baby, then you can feed the kid whenever they're hungry, which sometimes is every 20 minutes. Um, and so, and the other thing is when they start to get 
going. When they start to cry and get upset, you need to, you need to be there right away, within seconds. And so if you have four other kids and you're giving meds to that one, it's often 20 minutes before you can get there. And so the only person or people who could actually do those two things were somebody whose only job was to do those things. And that's none of us that was going to be a parent, and usually the mom, but not always. Um, so we, we, we started to realize, OK, so what we need to, if we're going to do this, we need to get the moms and dads to be there. And so, so that's what we did. And what we found is just by doing that, our length of stay went down from 22 and a half days to 13 days, which is, so I don't know if anyone, so you can think about your lengths of stay are for your places. So that was it. So imagine that was a medication that I, we said, oh, we just started giving this medication and we dropped the length of stay that much. We'd all be using that by now. But it wasn't a medication, it was mom. But we started to say, okay, well, let's just think of it as a medication. Let's think of mom as a medication and have that mindset. So we thought about, okay, so if, if you have pneumonia, mom is the antibiotics. So we just had, that's our first tenant of how we started to care for these kids. Mom is antibiotics, or if it's asthma, mom is albuterol. If you're in a non-neonatologist, you guys don't really do, neonatologists don't really do asthma, but pneumonia. Mom is the antibiotics, okay? So we go with that mindset. Okay, next. All right, so then we said, okay, these kids always go to the NICU. For us, they would go straight to the NICU. Uh, does anyone manage these kids anywhere other than the NICU now? Good, we got a couple, good. So, so why do they go to the NICU? Well, the reason they went to the NICU in our institution is because, well, that's what, where we always put them. Um, even though, like, we have all these premature babies, and these guys were like giants for those for the neonatologists. Um, so, why do they go to the NICU? I don't know. So, who was was anyone for those of you managing the NICU? Were you in the room where you decided to send them to the NICU? Probably not. Okay. So, uh, they don't need any. You know, we're one of those level, whatever the highest level, or the you know, we see all the the craziest things. So, these kids don't need lines. They don't need to be intubated. They don't really need anything that you would consider intensive care. So, why do they go there? Well, the major reason is because they've always gone there. The other reason that comes up is people say, well, well they're, they're, they're at risk of having seizures. And so we said, okay, great. Well, so we had a couple of answers to that in our institution. The first one is, okay, so what is their risk of seizures? So if you go back, there is a paper, uh, it's from the early 1970s, that says there's a 2 to 11% rate of seizures in these kids, which if you step back is a, for one study is a pretty broad range. Um, and so it turns out one of the guys who was the author in that study works in our health system. He's just retiring now. And so we asked him about it, and he said, yeah, we weren't really sure if those were seizures. <laughs> and if you, <laughs> the reason you have to go back to that 1972 paper is because there aren't any other papers that say that going forward. Uh, opioid withdrawal is not generally associated with seizures. Other withdrawals are benzodiazepine, other things can be, but not uh, opioid withdrawal. The other thing in our institution is we actually have a seizure unit. And so if you were a two-day-old who went home and had seizures and came back, you would not go to our NICU, you would go to our seizure unit. Uh, also, we don't keep people in the hospital or intensive care units because they might someday have a seizure. Um, so not everyone with, who has epilepsy is in our hospital living there. So that would also be a reason. So there weren't, so first of all, it's, they're not really at risk for it, and second of all, even if they were, they shouldn't go to the NICU. So what were the other reasons to go to the NICU? We didn't have any other than tradition. So, and if we look at our, if we, and there may be something more about that. So this is the website photo of our NICU. We just, by the way, built the, the most beautiful new NICU, but, but that uh, opened in January. And so for most of the time, we've had this one, and, and everyone looks relatively happy. Um, this was when I actually snuck in and took a picture. And so you can see, uh, you can see the nice place for the family to sleep and the, oh no, there's that one chair with the tape on it. Uh, <laughs> So there's this, like, if you could imagine a place that was less friendly for a parent to come, I, this, you, might you might design this. And you can think about, so remember, the first line treatment is non-pharmacologic care. So what of those things can you deliver in this, in this situation? They're going to sit in their isolate. They're going to be in this loud place because there's 12 babies going on. There's beeping. There's everybody working. So it's loud. It's bright. It's bustling. No one's there to hold them. They're being fed every three hours, so you can swaddle them. That's it. That's the only non-pharmacologic care you can give them. First-line treatment, and we have sent them to a place where you can't deliver it. So imagine you have a situation, and the parents can't stay. They can't even be in the room when you round because of HIPAA things. We've got to round around, the, you know, and you gotta, you're going to talk about all the patients, so they can't even come in. And when they do, they can sit in that little chair and kind of stare at their kid. So. Um, 
So imagine you had a kid with pneumonia, and they came into the hospital, and you had one unit that they don't, they don't carry antibiotics, and you have another unit that does. This isn't a trick question. Where do you send the baby? Okay, so, so we were taking, we said our first line treatment is non-pharmacologic care, and we have one unit where we can't deliver any of that, and one unit where we can't. Let's send them to the unit where we can't deliver that. So you would never do that in any other disease process. It's listed as the first line treatment. We've now shown that it really works. So we said, okay, next, why don't we not send them there? Because our general unit, uh, not the nice, it's not, not that nice. Uh, and this is actually isn't even a picture of it, but this is kind of what it looks like. You, we do have, we have single, some double rooms, but either way, at least one parent can stay. There's, there'll be a bed there for the parent. Uh, there's like a refrigerator. Uh, we, they can move in and they can be there all the time or somebody in the family can be there all the time. So we said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to not have these kids go to the NICU and we're going to transfer to the general inpatient unit. What we're going to do actually is when they're born, instead of sending them right to the NICU, we'll send them with the mom. When we said mom is the treatment, so they stay wherever mom is. So they go to the nursery, mom stays in the nursery, uh, they, they, they stay in the nursery together. It only took 18 months of negotiating to get our nursery to agree to do that <laughs> because they weren't having to deal with these families and they didn't want to start. So uh, they seemed like that was a lot of a, a kind of a big headache and nobody had really nice things to say about these families. So they were, there some, some thought it was a good idea but a lot of people were really resistant to it. And so the deal, the deal was is once the babies started to have withdrawal signs, so they started learning how to do the Finnegan scores, once they hit a score of eight, they could send the kid down to our general inpatient unit to me and then once the mom was discharged, she would follow. Um, and if the kid had another medical problem, they could go, they would send the kid to the NICU. And so the first six babies that we had all had another medical problem that caused them to be sent to the NICU, which all resolved in the first few seconds of being in the NICU. <laughs> Who knew? So there was a little bit of a protest vote with that. And then I'm going to come back to them because the, uh, the, the change in culture there has really been remarkable. So, but we, the idea was now we're just going to keep the baby and mom together. And then, uh, and so the, the babies would sometimes come down and the moms would follow shortly after, but most of the time they came down together. Next. Okay, and by doing that, now keeping them together, we were down to 10 days as a length of stay. And so you will see, though, you see some of those yellow lines popping up, and actually the red lines have gotten further, further apart. So what happened there? Well, some of those babies who did go to the NICU stayed there. The census in the NICU during that time was really light. So if they got one of these babies, they kept them for the duration. And so. And they, by the way, had no idea we were doing anything differently on the floor. We were just kind of doing this in our own little lab, just, just kind of saying like, boy, that seems dumb. Why don't we stop doing that? And we didn't really share it with those guys yet. And so if they got one, they were keeping them, and that's what, that's that, that's what that bump is. But even still with that bump, the average was still, still down quite a bit. Okay, then we started to think about the Finnegan scores, which those of you who've taken care of these kids, you know it well. Is anyone a big fan of it? Nope. Okay. Uh, all right. Well. Sorry about that. It's a, ni it's, a ni it's a nice tool. It's had its time probably. So next, so now, so there's some issues with it, and, and if anyone really likes it, I'm going to maybe make a little bit of fun of it. Um, so you could think of a situation where you got a kid who's got two scores of eight, and he's got three scores of seven, and he's sneezed three times in an indeterminate period of time, which is, of course is totally fine. But then he sneezes a fourth time, which we all know is unacceptable, and so he gets another point. And so now he's got three scores of eight, and now you've got to give him a dose of morphine. Except you don't give him a dose of morphine, right? You give him 100 doses of morphine, because you start him on his weaning protocol. So once he gets one dose, he gets, he gets it every, every three hours. You've got eight doses a day, and you've got to go down. You've got to stabilize it for a couple of days and go down by your little bit. So it's, it's a minimum of 80 to 100 doses once you give one dose. So that extra sneeze, cost you 80 doses of, uh, of morphine. Okay, so, um, so sneezing may be something that you see in withdrawal. Has anyone had a baby that sneezed before? Yeah. And what, what'd you do? Nothing, because you don't care. <laughs> you just don't care about sneezing. So one of the things on this, on this list, th there's lots of things that, that babies will do who don't have withdrawal, and a lot of them you frankly don't care about. There are three things on the list that have been shown to really be specific for withdrawal. 
Uh, and those are the, having the, the tremors when undisturbed consistently. You can see tremors in other kids, but it, it shouldn't be consistent like that. The, hyper, the increased muscle tone, that hypertonic kid. And again, I've seen about 500 kids exposed to methadone, and all 500 of them were hypertonic. Haven't yet to see one. I've seen a couple of buprenorphine-exposed kids who haven't been, but every one of the methadone-exposed kids. And then uh, the exaggerated moral reflex, which you talked about before. Those three things, you see those, those are probably withdrawal. And, and uh, has anyone? So I had uh, the this this project coincided with me having my first baby, um, <laughs> who I showed in the beginning, uh, and it was the it's like the only picture where he's not screaming that we have, I think. And so a lot of this was really really helpful. So he had that cry. He was not going through. He had it for a long time. Uh, so you will see that those will be specific, but you will and and all those all these things you can see in them. But the the you you can hear that cry in in other babies, and I certainly did. And we would walk around all night with, with our kid, and we would say, like, if I went to the pediatrician, was like, boy, he's crying a lot. What, what dose of phenobarbital are you going to give him? That was like, that seems ridiculous, but that's what we would do here. So, um, so, so that's so so those three things you'll find, and what you, but these other things are all are all there, and there's nothing that says as you get worse, that's when you that's when the sneezing kicks in, and then when you get a little bit worse, it's yawning, and then it's these things. These are all th you could see a little bit of all of these things, or and the kid could be doing relatively well, or you could just see a few of them, and the kid's not doing that well. So it is really just a catalog, and it's probably good for diagnosis and description, but it was not designed really for management. And uh, everyone uses eight, right? Who's using this? Okay, why do you use eight? Nobody? Who's in the room when you decided to use eight? So I bet you, have you ever been wondering why you use eight? I'm going to tell you. You ready? Here it is. Next slide. So the, this is from the 19, original 1975 paper. The infant with a score of seven or less was not treated with drugs for the absence syndrome because in our experience, he would recover rapidly with swaddling and demand feedings. Infants whose score was eight or above were treated pharmacologically. That's it. There's no follow-up studies. That's it. That's it. That's why you're using eight. It's from that paragraph in the 1975 paper. They picked eight. It became the law of the land. It became the box, right? That's the box. So this is not actually law. And there's actually no data behind it, but we created a box around this one. And so the idea of doing anything differently is just unacceptable. You could never do that. Why would you ever change from this? This is the law. A couple problems with the Finnegan. So if you use the Finnegan tool, you will have, you will, that approach leads to the longest lengths of stay of any, uh, any disease process in pediatrics. So that's some evidence for it right there. It also used lots and lots of medications which are of questionable safety. Uh, the whole purpose of treatment is just to bring the score down, is to get that sneezing from four times in an indeterminate period of time to three. Uh, so is anyone, so those of you who have done a, uh, a now remember, the, the, the idea of treating these kids is trying to keep them calm and quiet. Now, here's, this is another trick question. How do you tell if a baby has tremors when they're disturbed? You have to disturb them, right, okay. And how do you tell if they have a hyperactive moral reflex? Okay, just by looking at them, how can you tell? You can't, you have to do a moral, right. So in other words, you have to get them to do stuff. You have to exacerbate their signs of withdrawal in, in order to get an accurate score. So you have a kid who's nice and calm and quiet, and then you got to see if you can get them to do stuff and see if you, can get, if you can upset them, just to make sure that they have the capacity to have some of these signs of withdrawal. So it's actually, I would contend it's actively doing harm. This is not a good thing to be doing. Next. It's also slow to respond. So we would do them every four hours. Some places will do it, uh, get up to every two hours if the score gets high, but we wouldn't. So I'll give you an example. So you have a kid who's at noon, who is really miserable and is screaming and is difficult to console and is a disaster, and they have a score of 10. And so what do we do with that? Nothing. Okay. Uh, we, te we test it again at 4 o'clock. And same thing. Kid has been screaming the whole time, still miserable, another score of 10. Don't do anything. 8 o'clock rolls around. We do it again. Got another score of 10. Now we do something eight hours later. And so I never would be involved. I, we wouldn't hear anything. We would expect them to be miserable, and then we would do something eight hours later. Next. Okay, and so again, as I mentioned, it's, a, it's powerful and potentially harmful medications are given to treat a, an extra sneeze or a yawn. Again, these are things on here we just don't care about. So they may be signs of withdrawal, but you don't care about them. You will not, ha you will not pay attention to that in any other circumstance, nor do you treat anybody because they sneezed or yawned a few extra times. It, yes, it may be related to withdrawal, but that is not what you care about. Next. So we stopped using it. 
And then we thought about if we don't care about these things, what do we care about? And so we thought about it and we said, okay, we want them to like be babies. So what's the job description of a baby? What are they supposed to be able to do? Well, you, they should be able to eat and they should be able to sleep. They should be able to poop, which is not a problem with these kids. And you should probably be able to calm them down at this age. This is pre-colic. Colic's going to come, but, but, uh, but not, not now. So those are things that sh you should be able to do. So we said, well, okay, if you are having withdrawal signs, if you are sneezing a bunch, but you can do all those things, to us that, that meant that you were actually managing the withdrawal well. Because again, I don't need, I know if a kid is exposed to methadone, they're going to have signs of withdrawal. They are going to have this opioid withdrawal syndrome. They will be withdrawing. And I am yet to see one who hasn't. I would contend, I would love to see a methadone exposed kid with a significant amount, at least 30 milligrams or so that the mom's taking, who doesn't have some of these signs of withdrawal. If they have it, that's withdrawal, that's what we're talking about. That doesn't mean we have to give them medications, but we probably do need to treat them. So we stopped doing this and we said, here's the things we care about. All right, can you eat? Can you sleep? Can you be consoled? which we, uh, as, as the branding uh, ma uh, mavericks that we are, decided that was eat, sleep, console. Spent a lot of time on that, sadly. Uh, <laughs> we could be S-E-C, wait, wait a sec. It was, it was a disaster. I, <laughs> I don't want to think about it. Okay, now, so we, uh, we're, now we're part of a health system, and whenever you want to change something, it takes forever. And this is the one time we knew that would happen and took advantage of it. So we, we knew that we would start doing this eat, sleep, console, but we couldn't just stop using the Finnegan because within all the nursing protocols, in order to change all the nursing protocols, you had to get all the hospitals to agree to it and get a whole commission together. And so that was going to take a while. And it, and it did. It took several years, actually. So we were still gathering the Finnegan scores, but they were just buried in the chart somewhere. We weren't talking about them in rounds. We weren't presenting them. We didn't do anything with them, but we still had them. So what we did is we looked at 50 kids admitted to our inpatient unit from 2014 to 2015. Next. And we assessed them mostly every four hours. A couple of them were two hours and six hours. It was mostly every four hours using the Finnegan neonatal abstinence scoring system. But we did not, they did not use them to guide management. And we managed them using the Eat, Sleep, Console. Next. OK, so we looked at the proportion of infants that we treated versus the proportion that we would have treated if we used the Finnegan, which is easy. So if you had three scores of eight, we would have treated you with morphine. And we had to see if you didn't and who was different. And we got to see how often they disagreed, and then what happened when they disagreed. So in other words, when Finnegan said give morphine and we didn't, how'd the kid do the next day? So we had 50 kids, and we gave six of those 50 uh, morphine, or 12%. If we had used Finnegan, we would have given uh, 31 or 62% of them. So it was a big change. There was 25 kids who didn't get morphine using this approach. Next, and not, that's not a dose of morphine. That's, again, 80 to 100 doses. Next. So there were 78 days where the eat, sleep, console led to less morphine than predicted by the Finnegan. So in other words, we didn't give morphine, Finnegan said we should, or we went down on the morphine and Finnegan said go up. And here's what we found, that in 70% of the cases, the Finnegan scores were lower the next day and they were lower by about an average of a point. Next. And there were actually two days when it went the other direction. So Finnegan scores were fine, but the kid was inconsolable. We started morphine, and even in starting morphine, the scores were still higher the next day. So there were no readmissions, no seizures, no ICU transfers. These kids all did great. So our first tenant was, remember, mom is antibiotics. OK, now, with an NAS baby like this, what we would have done is give this kid morphine. It sounds like most of you guys would give morphine. OK, what would you do for this kid if it wasn't an NAS baby? You pick them up, right? That's not a trick question again. So uh, one of my colleagues who, who worked with us on the project went to uh, work at Michigan and she walked into a room like this and they were you know, calculating what, well, what dose of morphine should we give this? And she walked over and kind of got it out and picked the kid up, put a pacifier and bounced the kid, calmed right down and blew everybody's mind. They couldn't believe it. <laughs> so they didn't know you could do that. So the other tenant besides mom being antibiotics, here's the second one, pretend it's a baby. <laughs> do what you would do if it were a baby first. And usually a crying baby you won't put in a box, right? That's an unusual approach. That's just if you were to come across a crying baby in the street, you wouldn't just stand over it and wonder what dose of morphine to give it. You'd probably pick it up. So, so we said, like, okay, let's just pretend, let's just try to do what you would do if it were a baby. We know they don't need the intensive care, but maybe they, like, I had this really cranky baby and I was supposed to be walking around all night with it and not put him down. So what if we just sort of do that? 
next. So, um, so medication dosing. So we also thought about that a little bit. And so, of course, everyone goes down by the, has these weaning protocols once you start it. And so, so, so what is it going down every day? What is it about the earth rotating that one time? This doesn't have anything to do with the pharmacokinetics or anything. So why is that how we do it? Is anyone in the room when you guys decided how to do that one? Nope, that's just how we've always done it. So why do we do it that way? I have no idea. We do it in adults. I think there's some evidence in adults. And of course, we all know that babies are just little adults. So it's probably the same. So we said, OK, this seems silly. Because what, basically what we're doing is we're taking the first line treatment when they come to our floor and increasing it. And so can't we decrease? Because the kids who would get morphine were mostly kids who would go to the NICU first. Can't we just decrease it more quickly? Uh, and so we started doing it three times a day. And then we said, OK, wait a minute. What if we just, why are we doing it that way? So why don't we just give it as like a second line treatment just as needed? So instead of giving 100 doses when a kid needs it, we just give that dose and then reassess. So I'll give you an example. So it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The kid is miserable. We can't console him. We get everyone, we, the, the nurse says, hey, come, guys, come over here. Let's, let's see what we can do. We try to feed him. We can't do it. Mom's not there. First thing we do is call mom. That's the first line treatment. First thing we're doing is not giving medication. We're trying the first line treatment. Second thing we, OK, so mom comes back. Kid's fine. Second scenario, we do that. Mom's getting her methadone. She's not going to be back for two hours. We can't get the kid calmed down. We tried all our tricks. We give him a dose of morphine. He calms down. 6 o'clock, next dose is due. Mom's back. Kid's in her arms. Calm, quiet, eating well, doing everything. We don't give any more. The last kid we had, um, my team said, this is, the, this is the worst withdrawal we have ever seen. We gave this kid a ton of morphine. I was like, oh my god, how much? I said, we gave him six doses. That's the most. Like, it's usually one or two. So they gave six doses of blue. Like, our, our residents don't understand that morphine is a legitimate treatment for this anymore. I am, when I'm giving this talk in, in my hospital, I have to explain it's OK to use the morphine. They don't want to do it anymore, nor do the parents. Now we got down to seven days. And you see our standard deviations, three standard deviations, are now below the national average. Staff cares for the baby. So this is, this is the, the idea. We were not treating these families very well. We were not treating them the same way we're treating other parents. Next. So there's a really powerful uh, qualitative study that's, that goes over how moms feel who are treated in the hospital for this. This is something that's been addressed a lot. Next. So one is addiction is misunderstood. Who went into neonatal medicine because they're excited about addiction? Yep, nobody. OK. So. <laughs> And just the idea of society understanding this is more of a chronic disease than a choice. Next, they, moms feel guilty. They don't need us to tell them. They know that whatever they were taking, even if it was, um, even if it was prescribed, is causing their baby to go through this. They feel judged by the nursing staff. So there's also qualitative studies on the nursing side, which the nurses say we're judging them. So it seems to line up nicely. And then uh, they don't trust the nurses because they're going through that. I mean, there's three quotes. Uh, that I'm going to read for you. Her nurse was like, his muscles are locking up because of his junky mom. I didn't want to visit. I would call before, and if that nurse was there, I wouldn't even go. So imagine that experience. Next. Because we're going to leave, and he's going to cry, and they're going to leave him crying because they're going to be like, you know what? His parents are jerks. And next. This is a long one, but this was really powerful for us. If you're using while you're pregnant, you have a problem, a big problem. You need help. You obviously don't care about yourself, about anything except the drug. Make it a little bit easier on that mother if she's showing initiative, if she's taking the time to be there, if she loves her child. You can see it and you can feel it. If it's obvious that she's there for the baby, then embrace it. Make it easier. You don't know what her circumstances are. You don't know what she's been through or how hard her life has been. You don't know what she was feeling when she was pregnant, if she was being abused, if she was poor. Whatever the reason she was using while she was pregnant, you don't know. So try to make it easier for her. So we said, yeah, that seems reasonable. We can try to make it easier instead of making it harder, which is what we've been doing. We had taken this vulnerable family and made their experience much harder than every other family that came in. Next. So we said, we got to do this better. And so we realized our role was more as, um, as like a coach and a cheerleader. <laughs> so we weren't doing very much medical stuff anymore. And so really what we, again, we weren't trying to lower our length to say we wanted this to go well, not just in the hospital, but when they went home. So initially when we were discharging these kids, it would be 28 days. And we would say, all right, you're ready to go home tomorrow. And the family would be like, we're not, we're not ready to go. What are you kidding me? We don't have a crib. We haven't done anything. We don't. And we'd be like, Hi, it's been four weeks. How is this possible? And so what we're doing now is we are, the parents are doing all the work in the hospital. So we're able to work with them about how, what strategies and what's working and what's not and help them through it. Instead of thinking about what we used to see is that, well, you know, we'd hear a nurse say, you know, the mom looked really sleepy, so I called Child Protective Services. 
They're like, yeah, well, her methadone dose is 30% higher than it's supposed to be. 100% of moms going through that are going to be sleepier. So let's try to figure out how to work with that and discuss that with them and figure out how to support them. Say, you're doing great. Usually the baby eats at 3 a.m. Why don't I do that feed for you? And then you can sleep a little bit more like we would do with other moms. So our third tenant, then we got mom's antibiotics, pretend it's a baby, pretend it's a mom too. Do the same things you would do for any other mom. Support them the same way. It's why people got into this line of work, not to be mean to people, so support them. There are times where there is no, the parents just aren't there. And so what we found is that does not change what the baby needs. The baby still, the treatment for this is really simple. It's pretty much just love. And so if the parents can't do it, then we gotta figure out how to deliver it some other way. And so we use the white-haired ladies and we, I always assign a med student. It takes a village at that point within the hospital until we can get them to somebody who's gonna love them more full time. If we have a parent who's in a program and it's, and it's an inpatient program and they can't be in the hospital, what we used to find is when they were there, the kid would do fine. And then if they could stay the night, it was great. But the night that they couldn't, the kid would do much worse. And the scores would be, they get three scores of eight. And so does that kid need more morphine or more mom? And we decided the kid probably needs more mom. That's a kid we would discharge sooner so they could be with their mom. The treatment's over there. That's where the baby needs to go. So old protocol. Goal was to suppress withdrawal signs. New one, it's to have the infant function as a normal neonate. NICU, mom visits. Again, think about your own baby, the idea of visiting. Mother and child are together in our system. Wherever, however that works, they must be together. Finnegan score, treat the number. Here we eat, sleep, console, you actually treat the infant. And so one of the, um, I, I went to, uh, Dartmouth has done a lot of work. They're very, very proud of their non-pharmacologic care. And uh, they had a panel of five moms to talk about it. And the, it was an hour and the, their entire hour was spent talking about the Finnegan score and how, yeah, they had them like the cataloging, they had them taking a diary of all the withdrawal signs. I have no idea why, just so you can be reminded that they're, they're withdrawing, I guess. For no, and, and then they would say like, all right, they, they saw the baby sneeze, they wanted to make sure no one saw it because they knew that nurse at night scores a little bit higher and if they skip over to three scores of eight, they're gonna be here for two more weeks. That's all that they were, they were so stressed about that that the, all the support was sort of lost. And so if you pull yourself away from that and you start using the as needed dosing, that, that power is gone and it's much easier to get, should be much easier to give a dose or two here or there. Uh, everyone does supportive care, it's everyone's first line treatment. We're sort of zealots about it, that is the treatment. Feed on demand, I used to have a full head of hair, but I've heard not due to eat too many times, I pulled it all out. And so we don't have a feeding schedule anymore. I got, I got rid of it because I, I heard it one too many times. Uh, morphine was the key to our old protocol. Now that shows up on page three of our protocol. It used to be a surprise. We were preparing the parents prenatally. They tell us they want to deliver our hospital because they know that we, res that we respect moms going through this. They, we tell them what their experience is going to be. They're not staying, we're not, they're not trying to figure out how to stay four weeks in the hospital. They're trying to figure out how to stay maybe five days in the hospital, which is a lot more reasonable. So we do the prenatal prep. Staff takes care of the infant. Now the staff is there to coach. Staff is coaching them. So here's our final one for the last, and I haven't put the last year on, but we are, at, we are consistently now at 5.9 days as a length of stay, which is not, and that is over hundreds of babies. Um, and you can see where the, the average being 19 days are, are Two, three standard deviations is 10 days. So everybody pretty much is falling under 10 days. We did, we've had a couple, we've had three kids stay over 10 days who just had difficulty eating, who didn't really, didn't, it wasn't, they didn't respond to morphine. The kids who are sleepier when they're eating, we find don't respond to morphine, which is, should not be a surprise. So if you think of the percent of patients that we treated initially was 98%, do you, and you know what percent we treat now? We treat 100% aggressively from birth. And that's important, that terminology is different. We don't use medications. Our medication numbers are now less than 10%, but we treat every one of these babies aggressively from birth, just with non-pharmacologic care. And that terminology is important. The, the non-pharmacologic care doesn't fail. You sometimes need to eat, add medication, but it is always the treatment. We've gone up in the last five years above our starting dose on one patient. That was that one who got the six doses. They just went up a little bit higher. I'm not sure how to do that exactly. We don't wean, we just use it or don't. Our breastfeeding rates went from zero to about 50%. Our average cost of care, the suits really like this one, it got cut down by a quarter. Boston Medical Center started doing this and published something on this. Next, they, uh, they, used it as a, they actually used it as a scoring tool, which I find sort of silly, because secretly uh, the eat, sleep, console thing is what we do for all babies. Don't tell anyone, <laughs> next. And so they turned it into a scoring tool. We have a place you can, you can document it on our uh, Epic, but that's it. Uh, and they, they decreased their morphine from 82 to 
they weren't satisfied with their results, and so they actually came to visit us to find out what else we were doing so they could get under 10 days, which is where they were. The other thing, uh, Middlesex Hospital was that hospital I had to give that first talk to. They came back now almost two years ago, but about 20 months ago. Their length of stay was about four weeks at that point, and we were able to give them, go through our whole thing, and we, we met a family, we explained our approach, and on the 45-minute drive home, they entirely changed their protocol. They said, we are not treating a baby or family this way for one more day. And they, the, one of the people there was on that night. They started that night. They've not had a kid stay longer than 10 days since then, since that day. Uh, so that's the idea. Like most places are like, all right, we're going we're gonna to do this, uh, this, this small piece in, in June of 2019. We'll see how that goes for a few years, and we'll add this. They just did it that night. And it was a tough three weeks, and then that's just how they do it now. Next. So it's, it's spread to lots of places. We've published this uh, uh, in the summer of last year. It's being used in lots of different states. There's more publications coming out about it. It's obviously sort of common sense. Uh, and the people who have never heard of this just think we're all idiots, by the way. They're like, so you, my brother, I explained it to my brother. He said, so you prove that babies like their moms? Nice, nice work. It's like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, Long-term outcome data is really unclear, and we're going to learn more about that. There's a lot more grants out for that now. Uh, the general idea is it's hugs before drugs. It's empowering families. It's rooming in. It's non-pharmacologic care as a first-line treatment. It's using this eat, sleep, console instead of Finnegan, get rid of that, using as-needed meds, and really asking why. If you're going to do it the way you're doing it, make sure you ask why, and you have good reasons for doing it. Start from scratch. Wipe it away and decide what you're going to do. If you want to do it the same way, great, but have reasons for it. But I promise you they're going to be hard to find. Thank you. Question is, what about kids exposed to, to other than opioids as well? Yep. So if they're on, and particularly nicotine or methamphetamines, yep. how, do, how do you vary uh, so your protocol? So about 70% of uh, the babies in our, the data I showed you is actually just methadone exposed kids because those are the worst. If we included everybody, all the numbers are just down slightly. Um, and the, and the rates of treatment in the beginning were slightly lower. 70% of our kids are, uh, uh, moms are, are using nicotine uh, or smoking, and we don't have a lot of meth in the Northeast. We have a lot of other, about, uh, th I think, 35% of the, of the moms were using other drugs like benzodiazepines or other things that can cause withdrawal. So we do not have as much experience with meth. But I think the, this concept is not, so if it's meth, I don't think the answer is going to be to put the baby in a box and walk away. Uh, so I think this process, and I've been working with some people in West Virginia where, it, where they use everything you can find, including meth and gabapentin and all sorts, anything you can find. And it's still the same approach. It's harder, but it's the same idea. So uh, it's, it's the skin to skin and holding the baby and feeding them when they're hungry are going to pretty much be universal as a good place to start. And then the, uh, the last, we have two questions about this, and it's related to when you've lowered the length of stay, now they're going home quickly, and yep. the thought is, um, do they, A, what kind of support do they get after they leave, yeah. and then how do you intensify the support while they're there for that short period of time? Yeah, so that's where the, like, this is the, this should be the easy part, is, is, is. so what we're doing is, and what we used to do is just essentially press pause, and we would, we would take care of the baby, there would be no bonding, uh, which there's plenty of data on that in terms of development. That's not a good idea. There's like a whole, there's been a whole thing in the news about like separating parents and babies and kids. Has anyone seen that? Yeah. So we're doing that in the hospital. And so we should stop doing that. Um, and so that's bad. And so what we were doing before is not preparing the, them to go home at all. And now we're taking the entire time in the hospital to prepare the family and build the confidence that they can handle this. Because even if you're handing them off at four weeks, it's still a cranky baby. They're still going through some of the withdrawal. Now we're giving them the confidence that they know how to handle it. So we're trying to prepare them for that. We're getting the bonding. We're getting the confidence they can do it. And then we have a few things for we really think the supporting them afterwards is really important. So we have a couple of organizations that are more specific to the East Coast that do parenting support that we're getting these families into. But I think that's actually where the key is. In some places, Boston Medical Center has a whole clinic that just follows up. We have a developmental clinic that does that, but we have the parenting supports, which we've gotten from a few different angles. And I think that's really where the, where the, where the money is. This part is easy. Once you start doing this, this, is, this part's not complicated. It's the rest of that. This is, we want this to go well. Again, our goal was this not to lower language to say, but have this go well in the hospital and outside. And so in the hospital is not that hard. Outside is hard. Thank you so much for making the trip out and for helping us think out of the box. Hopefully we can take that same approach it's to, not the, a box. to the other problems that we're All looking right. at. So thank you.